On today's Monday Night Travel, we welcome back France expert Steve Smith. Joined by local battlefield expert Dale Booth, we get the story of D-Day in Normandy, where Allied forces cross the English Channel to help liberate Europe from Nazi rule. From Utah Beach in the west to Sword Beach in the east, we travel this 50-mile stretch, reflecting on the 80th anniversary of one of the last century's most historic events. Along the way, we throw in some tips for making the most of your visit. Thanks for joining us. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Monday Night Travel. My name is Ben Green, and I have the great privilege of moderating tonight's discussion of Normandy and D-Day area sites. All right, so now you can join me in welcoming one of our favorite Monday Night Travel guest stars, the co-author of our France guidebook, a tour guide in France, and an adopted Burgundian, Steve Smith. Bonsoir, Steve. Good evening, everybody. Good evening, uh, Ben and um, and Emily, you too. Um, welcome. Uh, hello from um, from Burgundy. Um, it's a but, little bit but, late, but we're okay. We're alive. We're up and running here. Yeah, I was going to say it's about 3 a.m. there, isn't it? Yeah, but just about. Yeah, you've got it. Uh, and and this is your sixth or seventh time with us, so I'm curious. Yeah. Are you becoming nocturnal yet? <laughs> well, some of these I've been back home for, yeah, back or back <laughs> in the stateside. You know, I I have one foot in uh, the United States and one foot foot in France, and so I've had a left foot and a right foot version both sides. It's a little bit easier when it's uh, your time. True. And how are things in Burgundy this visit? Oh, beautiful. I mean, it's it, it, we, we've had a cool spring. I can say that it's been a cool spring, but um, otherwise, no issues. Yeah, all good. Have you, have you had any tours? Uh, I did one. I've done one tour. Yeah. Yeah. Very nice. And, well, Steve, we are just so grateful you're taking the time once again to join us. I'll turn it over to you, I think, to give us an intro of Normandy. All right. Yes. And, and thank everybody for joining us. Everybody who's out there. Thank you very much. I'm going to um, I'm going to get right into these images because we have a lot to talk about today that I want you to know about. There we are. Um <laughs> Here's a map of France. It's uh, it's these color lines you see, by the way, are just different tours we do. It was a good way of just showing the outline of France. This is a country I I mean, from north to south, France is a, a, it's just a mesmerizing place with such a, a variety of iconic sites and mesmerizing scenery. The map allows us to get oriented. It's um, you know for, it's about eleven hours by car to twelve east west up and down. Um, every region in France, I say this all the time, but it's so true from like over here, I'm using my scroller from, is, is distinctly different from North, the Northeast corner of Alsace here in the borders, of the Rhine river in Germany, where sauerkraut and, and, uh, Riesling and Gewurztraminer wines are, are the trend down to the very South, uh, Southwestern corner of the map to Languedoc which is very Spanish and paella and things like cassoulet are on the menus. Every region in France, uh, just it, it's like going to a different country. And I love that part of traveling in this country. Today, tonight, we are going over here just above the one, um, or really just more uh, right above the, well, we'll zero you in above Chartres there to the, focus on the Normandy region. And this is a region that is do, uh, oh, character dominated by its coastline, um, and with dramatic cliffs like Etretat, um, it's connected to Paris's Normandy by the Seine River. And it's just a, it is, the, the Parisians like to call it their 21st arrondissement or 21st neighborhood, but there is nothing in common with Paris once you get out here. From thatched roofs to the best half timber architecture that Normandy features that you'll see anywhere in France, to, to really a, a couple of important sites um, that I'm just going to glean through, just so you know, you, when you go to Normandy, there's more than just the D-Day beaches, although we're here tonight to talk about the D-Day beaches. Here we're at Claude Monet's home at Giverny, where he tended his flowers and his art for the last 40 years of his life. It's just a stunningly beautiful place to go. And we give you information in our guidebooks, as you know, so you can be alone on that bridge and looking at his water lilies and ponds um, on your visit. It also, it's not just beautiful flowers, it's great cities like the city of Rouen, where just, a, just, just an hour outside of Paris, just um, 
beautiful city where Joan of Arc, by the way, historically was burned at the stake, but a lot more to see in this city, but that's the most salient part of the history there. An hour west of, uh, of Rouen lies the adorable today, but yesterday, very important uh, historic port city where sailing expeditions for over a thousand years hmm, would depart from here in Honfleur. It was also important in the, in the Impressionist movement. Claude Monet would come here to learn from his contemporary, Eugene Boudin, this little town, and they would paint outdoors. Remember, Impressionist art is about getting art to the outside. And on the beaches, scenes like this were instructive to Claude Monet. An hour south of Honfleur lies the surreal abbey of Le Mont Saint-Michel, one of the great pilgrimage sites for uh, Western pilgrims over the centuries. I like to say people to, or tell people to arrive after five. It's a, it's a darn busy, it's in fact, it's a zoo otherwise. Arrive after five, spend the night uh, at a hotel like this one on the island, see the abbey very late or first thing in the morning, and you'll be a lot happier. But here's the focus of our, there you are. Our, um, Normandy alone has enough activities and sites to keep people busy for weeks on end. Tonight, though, this is about the 80th anniversary of the D-Day invasions, and let's get into that right now. Uh, for a traveler, the best single best base for visiting the beaches is this beautiful town of Baia, which stands up to the D-Day beaches with its own sites, such as its grand cathedral here, uh, bigger as, as large as Notre Dame in Paris. Um, amazingly uh, undamaged during the war. In that uh, cathedral would hang one of Europe's great works of art, and that is the, the Bayeux Tapestry. It's actually a woolen linen, linen embroidery that stretches about three feet high, a meter high, and about 70 yards long. It tells the story of an uh, amphibious invasion that occurred almost a thousand years, a thousand years before the D-Day invasions, and that is the Battle of Hastings and William the Conqueror's defeat, sailing across the Atlantic, defeat Harold at the Battle of Hastings. All right, let's get into D-Day now. This is, Bayou was the first town city liberated by the, and, and we might learn differently later, uh, but that's what I understand, uh, by the Allies in World War II. And this would be the place where the, the, the Americans would set up camp. Uh, and in order for these... Um, for the D-Day invasions to be successful. Just a myriad of complex activities that we'll learn about tonight had to happen on time and on schedule. Boy, uh, paratroopers had to be dropped behind lines. Bombers and Navy ships had to deliver, uh, to, to uh, pummel, uh, pummel the German defense as best as they could to weaken them so that these infantrymen could land safely on beach as best as possible. Resistance workers also, by the way, had to cut communication links. All these things had to happen and more for the D-Day invasions to be successful. And it, this is a personal talk for me, by the way, because on a boat, just like this one in this image, did my uncle, my dad's brother, sail. And there he is, uh, Uncle Stan, who, was, who landed at the D-Day beaches. And it's thanks to him uh, that I know, I knew, I learned so much about uh, World War II and certainly the end of the World War. Um, and also, um, um, it's interesting to point out uh, that for the first 40 years uh, after the uh, of World War II, he would not talk about it. It wasn't until the mid 80s that I started, when I was doing the guidebooks, that I started learning from my uncle what he experienced in these landings. But and, and I want to say also, so this is a personal thing for me. I've learned more than um, uh, from guides like Dale here, Dale Booth, who is um, kind of our lead guide, the, the one I trust to go to for information and for making sure I get it right when I, when I write up the sites that you can visit on the D-Day beaches. I love recommending local guides anywhere in France. And Americans, you really should connect with the local culture wherever you are uh, by hiring a guide for half day or a full day. And by all means, a full day is essential on the D-Day beaches, particularly though here where America had some impact on Europe's history. Wow, I think it is such a worthwhile thing to have somebody in the know. Uh, like this guy who I want to introduce you to, to help you understand what is it that we're looking at. Dale, let's see. Welcome to Monday Night Travel. Hello, Steve. Mm. You're on the opposite side of the country. 
Yes, yeah, certainly are. We're, we're up north. And just as you said, it's been a very cold uh, spring. But I have to say that uh, today has, has been fantastic for the weather. Mm-hmm. And with the anniversary, it's it's madness out there. You know, the planes are flying over continually. Um, the volume of reenactors and vehicles this year seems to be absolutely immense. So I think particularly with it falling midweek as well, it's going to be a, a huge, a, a huge event. The fives and tens always are, um, but I, I really feel that these sites are getting bigger and bigger. The um, the anniversary, the ceremonies, the celebration of the liberty or liberation of the the place is um, is is growing on a on a decade by decade basis. Yeah. Yeah, that's Im- that's impressive because I know when I used to travel to the day beaches. It- to the the in Normandy, they used to say that they were worried that when the uh, soldiers died and, and there are few left who were able to come and participate, that might sh- uh, indicate a drop in interest. But it's been the opposite, hasn't it? Yeah, my my view is that um, since World War II, war has become far less defined. You know, it's very it's very difficult to measure the success or the failure, or you know, to measure what you've achieved in a conflict today. Um, Today, many enemies do not wear uniforms. They integrate with the populace. Um, And for me, I think with America in particular, although they probably don't think about it, the reality is that the the power of America comes from the invasion on these beaches on D-Day. America's political power, its economic power, its, um, its military power all comes from landing on these beaches and finishing the end of World War II as a massively dominant force. Um, and prior to that, Britain had, had played that role and it was now the baton was being handed over to the United States. So I, my own feeling is that it's the, if, if you can use the phrase, it's the good war. It's the war where we defeated an absolute evil. It is black and white. There are, there are very few blurred lines. Um, we defeated them. They placed their, their weapons on the ground. We put them in prisoner of war camps and we move forward and we create a, a democracy or many democracies in Europe that had, had slipped or were slipping into uh, autocratic states. So for me, it's, it's always going to pl- be a place that both Americans and Europeans can reflect on as leading us to the place we're at uh, today. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. I I remember um, in 1978 free camping above our homage in my beater old camper van with a buddy of mine and having a, a French man come up. We had a little USA I had a black tape on the back of our van because there weren't USA stickers available in Europe. And we were proud to be Americans. And he came up to us, Dale, and, and showed us pictures of his wedding. And he was wearing a military uniform from an American because that was only good clothes he could find. Um, okay. <laughs> and imagine the difference now. You couldn't free camp there to save your life. But boy, the importance not just to American culture, but also to French culture and yep. the, uh, the trajectory of this country right here at this one pivotal spot. Pivotal spot. Yeah. All right. Hey, Dale, should we get going? And and yeah. by the way, you were with the British military, right, for a while? That sort of your yeah, I, was, uh, I served in the British infantry from 1983 to 1989. Um, did a couple of uh, combat tours, but uh, I got married and the two were not going together. So I, mm-hmm. I left the military and just became obsessed with reading about war. But I'd, I'd been in interested in war since four and a half to, to five years of age. So, yeah, it's been a bit of an obsession. Yeah. All right. Well, you know, I don't know. We've known each other, I don't know, maybe 15, 15 years. And it's yep. it is a delight. it's good to see you, even though you're on the wrong side of the country. Yeah. Okay. And you- all right, let's go. Dale, let's get going. Let's tell these people what's good. What? All right. So, Dale, as we go, talk to us, will you, about what I'm looking at here. What are we looking at? Okay, so I'm I'm at the back there, um, but um, ultimately it is a group of veterans, primarily the 508th Parachute Infantry Regiment, 82nd Airborne Division, um, and D-Day veterans. But it's... Um, With this particular group, it was very special because they'd been back several times, but I managed to take them to places um, that they they memorised. And I was so lucky when I came to Normandy 21 years ago, it was at a time when the highest number of volume uh, of um, 
and veterans were coming back. And if you take the 60th anniversary, there were 10,000 veterans here. And you could just bounce from one to the next one. And because there were so many, they were so happy to share their stories with you. Sometimes you just got connections, you know, where you could get a telephone number or a, an email address and you could build on the relationship and build on um, gaining information. But it was always the little anecdotal stories that we got off them. And, uh, and again, at that time, I would say when I was working for another company every third or fourth tour would have a d-day veteran on or a battle of normandy veteran so that they were very special days and of course those days have gone we may have a couple of hundred veterans here for the for the anniversary this year um but ultimately you know your ability to interview them to gain information is limited but they were certainly great times wow that's a great picture wow that's yeah yeah, this is a, a great photograph, and it's not actually taken too long ago, um, but a lot of people do not realise, but in the town hall of St. Mariglis, the first town liberated by the Americans on D-Day, the commander of the 3rd Battalion, 505th Parachute Infantry Regiment, 82nd Airborne Division, uh, went to the town hall, and we're in it there, and he basically hung out of the upstairs window, ripped the German flag down, the Nazi flag, the swastika, and he raised this flag. And it's a tiny little uh, flagpole, so it was absolutely swamped with this flag. But it is the first American flag raised in northwestern Europe um, by the American military. Um, and when you think of American flags that are iconic from World War II, you know, Iwo Jima is, is, is number one. There's, there's no question. But a lot of people do not realise the significance of that flag. And very few people actually go and visit it. Um, I'm surprised they haven't put it in the museum so it can see a greater uh, number of visitors. But just a very special uh, flag, a very special uh, place to visit. I always find it very special to take people in there. OK, now this map just gives you a basic understanding of the Atlantic Wall, the German coastal defensive zone. So if we look at the light red uh, element of northwestern Europe, we can see around the coastline that there is a red line. And that is all the area the Germans have to defend. It is Norway, Denmark, Holland, Belgium, France, all the way down to the Spanish border. And when we look at England, the United Kingdom, or Britain, should I say, uh, which is the gray element of the map on the front left-hand side, look at its proximity to, to France in its bottom right-hand corner in terms of, of Britain. Um, and that is the Par de Calais region with a 21 mile crossing point. Um, but ultimately it was the most dangerous place to attack because the Germans knew it offered everything we needed, and ultimately, it was the most heavily defended area. We looked for another option, and the only feasible option, historians will tell you Norway and the Bay of Biscay are, are feasible, but the reality is the only other feasible option was to land in the Bay of the Seine, Normandy. Dale, when I look at this, I can see Dunkirk right there by Calais, and it reminds me of the movie that I saw. And okay. I'm thinking of that huge um, evacuation um, and the, the 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 gripping events there. What happened after Dunkirk that allowed us to regroup uh, and uh, launch the invasions of Normandy? Good. So ultimately, at, at Dunkirk, it is a, a massive failure. Ultimately, the actual evacuation is a success, but ultimately, the British army had been completely routed, as every other army would be for for the next couple of years. Um, but luckily, we do get the bulk of the army out. We got 338,333 men evacuated at Dunkirk, but they, they'd lost all of their heavy equipment. And ultimately, the next couple of years for Britain and its Commonwealth, its empire, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, India, the list goes on and on, it had reeled from one disaster to another. But Britain has managed to stay in the war. America, of course, enters the war on the 7th of December 1941 in terms of the Pacific. And six days later, Germany declares war on the United States. With Britain remaining a free nation, it can be a launching pad um, for allied forces, primarily um, 
led or driven by the United States, but it will include 13 main nations for D-Day in terms of crossing the English Channel and getting a foothold on uh, on French soil, basically. Right. All right. Great. Let's get right to the D-Day beaches now. Thanks for that backdrop, Dale. OK, so if we look at the uh, map and we're looking at the bottom right hand side, um, this is the Bay of the Seine Normandy. And if you look at La Havre, that is actually the Seine, uh, what would you call it? The, the entry point of the River Seine going towards Paris, giving this area its name, the Bay of the Seine. Now, in terms of Normandy, there are, there are several disadvantages of landing here to the Pas de Calais region, but I'm gonna keep it very simple. Number one, it was an additional 110 miles to move our army from the Bay of the Seine to uh, the German border, as opposed to the Pas de Calais region. Secondly, um, our air force, fighters and ground attack aircraft would only be able to spend a limited time over here. Um, and we've got to overcome that problem as well. And then the third major problem is distance. Distance for our army and our navy to cross the English Channel. I've already mentioned in the Pas de Calais region, we're looking at roughly a 21 mile crossing point. It is 100 miles here, 200 mile round trip as opposed to 42 miles. So how do we overcome that? Well, we basically, I've uh, just missed one thing out, guys, and that is actually one of the bigger elements, and it is that in Normandy, there is only one deep water harbour, and it is Cherbourg, and you can see it at the top of that thumb of land jutting out into the sea. So in the Pas de Calais region, we've already mentioned Dunkirk, there is Calais, Boulogne, Dieppe. So that gives us a massive opportunity in the north of landing vast amounts of material, and that's not the case in Normandy. How do we overcome the problem? Well, very quickly, um, I can tell you in the first 34 days of landing using aviation engineer battalions, we construct 34 fully operational airfields in Normandy. How do we overcome the deep water harbour problem? We manufactured and we, we floated over massive artificial harbours of which we will construct two, one on Omaha Beach and one on Gold Beach. Of course, one for the British Second Army, one for the First American Army. And the final solution of moving that extra distance is overcome by Pluto, pipeline under the ocean, Pluto. Um, it was designed by the British in 1942 and it had never been used in any operation, but it was a flexible pipe um, that will be laid from the Isle of Wight on the south coast of England. You can see that island uh, just below uh, the British flag. And yeah, we've got the icon on it now, the mouse. Um, and we will basically lay that onto the, onto the uh, seabed, bring it up at Cherbourg for the Americans and Gold Beach for the British. And we will keep laying that pipeline all the way to the German border. And by the time we shut that pipeline down, uh, 11 months later, we had pumped an additional 173 million gallons of fuel underneath the English Channel. So that means that Normandy becomes a viable option uh, to invade. And of course, not the most heavily defended, but make no mistake, it is the second most highly defended area of that two and a half thousand miles of Atlantic Wall. Wow. Okay, this is a, is a great map that gives us some idea of scope. And I haven't mentioned it, but from the most westerly beach, which is Utah, to the most easterly beach, Sword, it is 54 miles of frontage that we assault on D-Day. Now, if we include the British Airborne, which is to the east of Sword Beach, in a sector that we actually codenamed Band, then the total frontage attacked by the Allied forces on D-Day is 61 miles. So wherever you are in the United States, I would love for you all to think of a town, a city or a feature that is 60 miles from where you live. Now think about laying an army out between your house and that point. Now think about doing that attack across water and make no mistake, this is the biggest amphibious assault the world has ever seen.
Now we'll start from the west and work to the east. So Utah Beach is at the eastern base of the Cotentin Peninsula. Again, that thumb of land jutting out into the sea. It is American. It is the only beach that runs primarily north to south rather than east to west or west to east. But Utah Beach, American, uh, attacked by the 4th Infantry Division. We keep going to the, the east uh, and we end up at the most famous of the beaches, Omaha. And it's important to note that that is the only beach being assaulted by two divisions. All the rest are one. Um, and that's important because it gives us balance between the two army groups. So those two beaches, that is the 1st American Army under the command of General Omar Bradley. But if we keep now going to the east, we can see the first of the Union Jack flags, and that is uh, the British 50th Tyne Tees Division with the Malta Brigade attacking Gold Beach. Um, more to the east, we have Juno Beach, the Canadians. And make no mistake, in terms of Canada, for their commitment on D-Day, I know it's going to sound mad, but in terms of resources and manpower and economic input to D-Day, Canada is bigger than Britain and the United States. Their population was only 11 million people. Um, so to think that they can take on a full beach, that they can commit 120 sick warships and ships in general to the invasion, 10,000 Canadian sailors. And on top of that, ultimately, uh, huge numbers of the Royal Air Force by this point of Royal Canadian Air Force. Nobody will push inland further on D-Day than the Canadians, but every single one of them is a, is a volunteer. So Canadians should be incredibly proud. If we go then to the east of that, we come to Sword Beach, which uh, again is British, attacked by the 3rd British uh, Infantry Division, Juno Beach, the 3rd Canadian Infantry Division. Now, those three beaches, that is the 2nd British Army under the command of a, gem a guy called General Miles Dempsey. Now, in terms of the beaches, we, we, we're set up, but in terms of the airborne forces, these are elite paratroopers and glider-borne forces that will land on the flanks. Now, again, back to the American sector directly behind Utah Beach are what are now two very famous airborne divisions. The AA, the All-American 82nd Airborne, the 101st, the Screaming Eagles. Now, they numbered 15,500 men, roughly 13,400 paratroopers, 2,100 glider-borne soldiers. Now, the gliders, get these white plastic fiberglass things you're seeing on runways out of your minds. These are massive engineless disposable aircraft. We will drag them across the English Channel on a rope 110 feet long, uh, attached to an obsolete bomber or a C-47. Once they get over the Normandy territory into their pre-designated areas, we disconnect the rope, the glider will circle, hit the ground, and men will come out of them. But that is not why we use gliders. It is to bring in jeeps, jeeps towing artillery pieces, jeeps towing trailers full of ammunition, engineering equipment, field hospitals. So what they're actually going to do is silently deposit all the heavy equipment into the paratrooper areas so that they can hold off German counterattacks and protect the beaches. In the British sector to the east of Sword Beach, we can see a small Pegasus emblem, which is burgundy and blue, um, just to the left of a parachute. Um, and that is the British 6th Airborne Division, approximately 12,600 men strong. But as I say, the airborne are going to protect the flanks of the, the attacking beach forces. Let's get out and see the sights. What do you say, Dale? I mean, okay. now, thank you for that setup. Okay, Go so... East to uh, west to... West to east, okay. So this is St. Maraglis. Uh, St. Maraglis is an incredibly visited site. You can see the famous church there, and we have the paratrooper mannequin hanging off the steeple. That was actually a paratrooper called Private John Steele, 32 years of age. Paratroopers tended to be very young. Um, that incident did occur, and he's believed to have been the oldest man in that uh, battalion of 650 men to jump in on D-Day. But he is not the only paratrooper to land on the church. There was another guy 
who was only 17 years of age and his name was Ken Russell and he landed on the lower section of, of roof. But 17, just a, a kid. And of course, he'd lied to get into the airborne. Now, in terms of that town, what is worth visiting? Well, the church itself is incredible. It has a couple of uh, stained glass windows in there that are airborne. One that was put in in 1949 by the, the town. Absolutely incredible with paratroopers descending. And another one committed to and funded by the Americans, the returning veterans in 1969. Um, but a lot of young Americans will have been killed and wounded in that square in the incident when John Steele descended. Sends, um, and also the Germans uh, obviously being fought to the point where they're kicked out and then ultimately um, the shelling of the town over the next two days. But within that town is an absolutely superb museum. It's expanding all the time in its uh, scale and size, different buildings being opened and constructed all the time and new material put in. But if you are going and you get time to go to a museum, in terms of American Airborne, you will not get better than that. It is absolutely incredible. You are, by the way, St. Mary Glees for travelers. If you're staying in by you, you could sleep here. There's plenty of hotels in St. Mary Glees, too. It's about, what, an hour's drive, I think. That's as far as you're driving in any one direction to see this 54 miles of uh, of, of D-Day beaches. Yeah, it's, it's amazing, Dale. This just reminds me, every year I go to update the books, there's a lot, not just something, but a lot new and improved on the D-Day beaches. They just don't yes. stop finding no. new ways to explain these battles to us and so that we bring back better memories and more understanding of what transpired. Yeah. If like, I can just... You know, my so favorite here is the Waco Glider. The Waco Glider. <laughs> so um, Steve definitely, um, he, yeah. he's, uh, he gets very excited by the gliders, <laughs> although whether it's the excitement or the, the fear of what it might have been like coming in in one, um, is is probably more to the to the case. So the the gliders are, are either made of plywood with timber framing, or with the American Waco glider, and they use the British and the the American. Um, it's just tubular frame with a, a form of plastic spread over it. But to think that it could hold a jeep and five infantrymen and and the two man crew, or the horse glider made of plywood and timber framing that could hold. 32 men fully loaded with all their assault equipment. It, they were known as flying coffins, and there's a very good reason for that. You have to, so in this museum, I mean, really, there's one room, one area that's just dedicated to, to that glider, and, and it comes to life so much more when you're there. It's one of, this is all about the D-Day beaches you have to go to see. You can't really appreciate it unless you're there in person, right, Dale? Yeah, okay. yeah. We move on. This is an important site, I know, and to you. Yeah. And, so this is a, a is a site that is slightly lesser known, but if you want to go off the beaten track, it's certainly worth a visit. I've actually recently finished a, a book uh, called Geronimo's Medics about it, and all the money, all the, the, the proceeds go to the village association. But it, basically, that tiny little Norman church was used by two American medics to set up a first aid station on D-Day, and I think we've got their, their pictures. So this young man, his name was Robert Wright. Robert Wright was from uh, Ohio. Uh, he was 20 years of age when he jumped in on D-Day. He would have been 5'3", five, 5 feet 4 inches tall. Um, but he was a tough little guy. He was actually a wrestling champion at 17 within his weight division um, for Columbus uh, City. And he would become the runner-up state champion. Um, but uh, incredibly compassionate. And he excelled at, uh, at um, his medical course. This is Kenneth Moore, who through choice made a decision eventually that he didn't want to kill another human being and that he would ultimately um, want to help others. So he became a stretcher bearer. But ultimately, these two young men will land around the little village of Bongerville, meet up at the little church, and they will basically set up the first aid station on their own. And within that little church, and I think we've got another shot coming up, um, uh, this photograph, actually, the, the church is the next one, but this is actually the church behind oh, sorry, you. Dear. OK, don't worry. So if we just go back to the other one, um, Steve. So this is the church behind you looking down the road 
walking away from the church. And the buildings over on the left, that became the headquarters for the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment. For those that are into the Band of Brothers HBO miniseries, um, that's definitely relevant. And that's paratroopers walking away from us, probably heading towards the Battle of Carantan, another famous battle. But if we go to the, the church photo at this point, internal uh, photo, now, at this point, you're seeing the main body of the church, um, and this um, is, I suppose it would be the western side. Um, the photograph is taken from the centre where the steeple is, and the bottom end is probably half the area you're seeing there, so it is tiny. And as I say, there were 80 wounded in there. And I think what's important to recognise, it, it was roughly 73 Americans, seven Germans, although an order had been given, unfortunately, not to take German prisoners. And um, these two kids made up their mind, no matter what, whether you were an American, a German or a French civilian that needed medical assistance, if they were capable of giving it to you, those two young kids would. So seven Germans and ultimately one little 13 year old boy. But the place is unchanged and you walk into these places and you just feel the emotion of what went on there. And there are blood stains on the, the seats mm. of, um, of the pews. Um, and the men were laid on the pews. They were laid on the wooden floor at the base of the pews. They were laid down the aisles. And it's instant when you walk in. You can feel um, these young kids. You can hear them moaning, crying, asking for more morphine to be, to be given. But those medics will end up staying in there treating those men for over two days, which is is incredible. But um, again, it's one of those little sites that you can do as an extra. Um, certainly some guides could take you there if you ask, but it's a very special and very moving uh, location. Okay, this gentleman, uh, his name is um, Theodore Roosevelt Jr. He is the son of the 26th American president. He is the assistant divisional commander to the 4th Infantry Division. He was just under 57 years of age on D-Day. Um, he is believed to be the oldest man to have landed on any beach on the 6th of June 1944, the day of the attack. Um, and he basically bullied his uh, commanding officer um, to be allowed to go into the assault. And Unfortunately, the forces dragged to the south in error through tidal pull and smoke covering the coastline. Uh, the loss of control craft that would lead in the first two waves as well. But he recognises they've landed incorrectly and he comes out with this fantastic line. We're going to start the war from right here. And at that point, um, it'll say in a lot of books, he's 15, 1,500 yards off his, uh, off his initial point. He's actually about a mile and a quarter to a mile and a half south. But incredible leadership, decisive, and he will eventually die five weeks later of a heart attack in Normandy and be awarded the Medal of Honor for his action on Utah Beach. So this is actually a, a photograph of the, a little bit of the, the museum, which we'll come to in a second. Uh, I think Steve will probably talk a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, um, that beach is a massive success story. The, the casualties on that beach are somewhere in the region of less than 200 men killed, wounded or missing, pushing up to four and a half miles inland and landing 23 and a quarter thousand men there. So it's a huge success story that does not get the recognition it rightfully deserves. And the reason is there's not enough death, there's not enough misery, and unfortunately, it sells. You know, when you think of the, uh, the newspaper saying, if it bleeds, it leads. So unfortunately, uh, it doesn't get the attention that it should do. And the airborne landing behind Utah Beach, ultimately, it's the same it's the same operation. The airborne will stop the Germans counterattacking, securing uh, objectives that will make the beach a huge success story. But um, by the time you finish landing on that beach, and we're talking about five months later, you have landed 438,000 soldiers there and 200 and 20,000 vehicles. But I think Steve will probably talk a little bit about the, the museum for you. And what uh, I'm, and yeah, thanks, Dale. Yeah. What I'm looking at, I think it, it's, it's, it's built over several German bunkers, isn't this uh, museum, yes, Dale? Yeah, it's got four bunkers inside the, the museum. 
Yeah, and inside the museum, it is there's there are so many museums on the on those 45, 54 miles. There are a, like four that I recommend really highly, and that's partly thanks to my travels with Dale. And this one was is only I don't know seven or eight years old um, that that I know of Dale, and it is just a great display of the well the B twenty six bomber here, right? I mean, and equipment and all the ships, uh, the landing craft like the Higgins landing boat. It it is a and you're right on the beach. It is really evocative. And yeah. anything to say about the B-26 Dale before I move on? Well, basically, that's probably the rarest bomber, surviving bomber. There, there, I had a quick look. I could only find that there's five complete ones in the world, and none of them fly. So the, mod, the, the one that they have in that museum is a, an original World War II one, but latter part of the war. Um, it is incredibly rare, and the condition of it is phenomenal. So it's probably the best example in the world. Um, but in relation to that museum, just building on what Steve says, I love it because not only is it spacious and well lit and it's, it's very modern in its appearance uh, internally, but it's the fact it covers every element of D-Day um, with just a tiny bit of airborne. So if you're going to do the Airborne Museum in St. Mary's, this one is the perfect complement um, because it covers all the other elements that the Airborne Museum doesn't. Yeah. So there's one the of the... display room. Yeah. Go pounds. ahead, Dale. Yeah. And yeah. um, so all of the, the, the German defences, all the bunkers were connected by trenches, very similar to, to mm -hmm. what you see uh, there. But we'll talk a little bit more about the defences uh, shortly. But uh, again, a, a fantastic, well lit, spacious museum. Yeah. All these museums have this, this one has about a 15 minute video that's done in English, with, which is just a great background on what the museum features and not to be missed when you visit these sites. Now, yeah. this is. Uh, Going further west, Dale, this is one of the most powerful sites for, for anybody to visit, but certainly for Americans at the point yeah. of hook. Yeah. So if we just go to the, the next slide, um, point of hockey is basically a point of land that juts out into the sea, as you can see on this photograph. Um, but the problem with point of hock is that point of land is in between Utah Beach over to the west, which is the left of what you can see, uh, but eight miles away, and over to the right, um, we can't see it, but, but you wouldn't be able to do even if we, we zoomed out for, a, for, a, for several miles, is Omaha Beach. So it's perfectly positioned between the two. And unfortunately, we knew that position there was six captured French World War One artillery pieces. Still a relatively modern piece of equipment by 1944, but unfortunately they had a, a, a maximum range of 13.4 miles um, and an effective range, which means you can aim at something and try and hit it at 11 miles. So if those six guns open fire, they can hit both beaches and they can clip the edge of the Utah invasion armada. So General Bradley said it was the most dangerous German gun position overlooking the American sector on D-Day. And you can see by the indentations on the ground that, that we've bombed it. And we basically bombed it for seven weeks leading up to D-Day, dropping close to 10 kilotons there, which is ultimately the same explosive power as the atomic bomb dropped on Hiroshima. But the problem is the site sits on top of 100 foot cliffs. So if anybody's gonna be attacking that, they will need to be the cream. And those troops were the second Rangers Battalion. So they basically scale the cliffs, get into the position. Unfortunately, the guns had been withdrawn, but only about a thousand yards further inland. And eventually those troops will locate the guns down a, a track uh, and they will neutralize them. So. For the American Rangers, that is the the starting point of, not the starting point of their history, but certainly of the traditions of launching these incredible assaults with specialist trained soldiers. Um, and as I say, in World War II, Rangers were the cream of the American army, the most elite forces to be engaged by the American military during that period. I look at this image and it never ceases to amaze me how absolutely vertical those cliffs are and dale if i'm right they the um they had to time their landing when the tide was out is that right so that they could set up yeah. ladders yeah yeah on, on all the be beaches we decide to land at low tide because mm -hmm. the germans one knew that of course we would want to land at high tide 
we will we land at high tide we don't have to cover any distance but the germans had covered all the beaches in obstacles and they would sink a lot of our landing craft and bl possibly block the beaches as well so we made a decision to land at low tide on all the beaches now this is just a tiny battle of initially just 225 men but there were no beach obstacles there but we do need space because the british crews taking in um, the rangers will spend over two hours on the beach offloading ammunition and supplies so the rangers can maintain the battle on the top of the cliff. And the reason there was no obstacles on the beach is the Germans had done a feasibility study when they were going to decide to put the guns there. And they believed that nobody would attack the position <laughs> by climbing up the cliff. Um, so it, it didn't, this one particularly didn't have the obstacles, but we definitely need that space. But an incredible site is covered in, in bonkers. Um, and it's certainly one of the most visible sites in, in Normandy. And um, this is actually from a little bit, probably a couple of hundred yards further inland from the point itself. And you can see a, a monument. It's actually depicting a dagger thrust into the German observation bunker and command post. And um, three American presidents have, have stood there. So Eisenhower in 1964 with Walter Conkright, um, Reagan in 84, giving one of his best ever speeches called The Boys from Point to Hot, written by Peggy Noonan, and Clinton in 94. Because of the, the amount of space involved and the amount of bushes and trees and craters, I don't think we'll see an American president there for a long time. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a shame, um, but, uh, you know, terrorism has, has reduced the, uh, the possibility of that happening, I think. It's a gripping site. It's a it's a must for for anybody visiting the D Day beaches. Okay, yeah. let's keep going west, Dale. We got we'll move this along. Okay. Yeah. So this this is Omaha Beach. Uh, it's not quite low tide, but it's getting there. Low tide in the middle is over four hundred yards of beach. And bear in mind, I've already told you we're going to land at low tide. Um, and on the if you get closer to the flanks, because the beach is concaved in shape. The average is probably 300, um, but the overall, I always say the distance the men have got to cover as an average is 350 yards with the Germans on this incredible high ground bluff. Now, in the foreground, we can see a German bunker, and that is an 80 millimeter German um, mortar position. And there are actually four mortars at that particular strong point. But I need to explain something um, before we can move on. The Germans did not build a bunker every 25, 50, 100 yards along that two and a half thousand miles of frontage. They worked out the most likely places where a beach assault could take place, and they built self-contained forts called Widerstand nests. The nearest English translation is resistance nests, and you're just seeing a little bit of one there. So basically, they select the ground, surround it in barbed wire, and an average Widerstand nest might be 200 yards deep and 500 yards wide, all the way around the, the wire will be a minefield. On the inside of the wire facing outwards will be flamethrowers. And of course they'll position them into areas they think we will try and penetrate the wire. Then all the bunkers will be situated to give them all round defense, but most of them will be able to fire onto the beach. Um, all the bunkers are connected by zigzagging trenches um, so the Germans during the battle will never have to show their heads above ground, but there will be machine gun positions, mortar positions, gun positions, artillery, communications bunkers, observation bunkers, command and control bunkers, storage bunkers, accommodation bunkers, and so on. So what they will do is build a Widerstand nest and then literally um, 400 yards away, another one, 800 yards away, another one. But they have interlocking fire, which means that they can have gaps in between them, but it's just as dangerous to land in between as it is to land in front. Um, but Omaha Beach itself is four miles in length. Um, and the whole four miles was to be assaulted on D-Day by the 29th Infantry Division and the 1st Infantry. And this is a photograph of me starting to draw a Widerstand nest, which is one of my little fortes on Utah Beach, um, to explain the defences to people, because everybody has this idea they're thinly stretched along the coast. They are self-contained forts 
defended by beach obstacles, wire, minefield, mines, and then all the bunkers protected inside that, uh, that, that position. I believe this is one of our tour groups. I think it probably is, yeah. 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 If, yeah. And this, yeah, okay, Dale. And this is the beach, Omaha Beach, where Saving Private Ryan was filmed. And yes. such scenes. Uh, will you take? And this is the kind of boat that my uncle dropped off of uh, and uh, managed to survive. And you know, I look at these soldiers, Dale, and it reminds me of the stories that my uncle would tell me. And and uh, he would later go inland through St. Lowe and then on to Bastonia, which was brutal and freezing cold. Um, yeah. And he said, and he got all these awards and and, and uh, remarkable uh, honors, etc. But he said, I was, I, I, I just got lucky. I, I didn't do anything ex exceptional. I just survived. Yeah. And you think of those guys out there in the water, where the, how much of their packs weigh? Tell us about this, will you, Dale? It, yeah. Okay, so if if the packs are dry, they would weigh sixty five pounds. That would be the average, but that's what we class as assault equipment. Um, and this is actually taken in front of where the American cemetery is today. So you can see the high bluff off in the distance, which is anything between 90, 150 feet high. And there it's at the higher level. You can then see the beach that they're advancing towards. But unfortunately, most of the landing craft at Omaha Beach bottomed as an average 100 yards out at sea. So you've got to wade through the water and the beach undulates, which is why it's bottomed. And if we look at the guys that have just exited, you can see literally that the, the water is up to their backsides. The reality is, look at the guys further forward, they're going down into the undulation. So a lot of men were having to drop their, their weapons. But it is the most famous beach and it's the most famous because unfortunately, it was the worst beach to assault in terms of ground and everything that could go wrong did. So you talked about luck with your, your uncle. You know, it, it, on Utah Beach, we have elements of luck. On some of the other beaches, we do. But as I say, there's virtually nothing that went to plan on this beach. Everything collapsed and the casualty list was, was horrendous. Um, killed, wounded and missing on Omaha Beach by the end of the day, um, was 4,800, but there were another 600 men who were so debilitated by shock and hypothermia, a combination of the two, they were full-blown mental health hospitalizations. So killed, wounded, missing and debilitated on Omaha Beach is 5,400. Um, it would be over 40% of every combined Allied casualty on D-Day was on that beach. But I'll tell you what, make, uh, yeah, what makes it so special. It was the worst beach to assault. They, everything that could go wrong did go wrong. So what makes it special? They still took it. And let's remember, this is not the professional armies that we have today. These are primarily civilian, I'll use the Stephen Ambrose phase, civilian citizen soldiers. They still took it despite everything going wrong. The bombardment missing, landing craft all dragged as an average a thousand yards to the east of where they should have been, bottoming out at sea. The, the, the Germans were just ready and waiting for them and the machine guns uh, did devastating work. Saving Private Ryan, the beach scenes were actually filmed in uh, County Cork in Ireland, um, but the images of what they're portraying, the, the, the men being cut to ribbons, it's, it's Omaha, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's just brutal. You know, there will be no person that lands on that beach for the next 12 hours and we land at 6.30 in the morning who would not be a changed human being. Um, it would it would affect most men. And they would say, whenever I spoke to veterans or you read accounts of veterans, if they did multiple landings, um, Omaha was by far, by far the worst thing that they, they ever endured. And uh, men just completely froze. They could not move. Um, you know, people don't realize, but when you come under fire, the first thing you do is hit the ground. Your brain will do it for you. And once you hit the ground, it's over. Only a 4% group, a 4% average number of people will be physically capable of getting up and running around it. So most veterans are talking about, I managed to get to this point or that point. 
and I was there for several hours. But Saving Private Ryan, it's all over in 17 minutes. The reality is the Battle of Omaha is 06.30 in the morning to 8, sorry, till 12, sorry, 2.30 in the afternoon. So it's eight solid hours of, of battle. Only then do the German Widerstandness collapse. Now, this guy actually landed slightly to the east of where, um, probably about a thousand yards to the east of the photograph that we've just seen. His name was uh, Jimmy Monteith. He was already a veteran. He was incredibly proud of being in the 1st Infantry Division, the big red one. He communicated with his mother continually. Um, and he, he actually said, every time I look at my shoulder, I'm filled with pride at, at, at my 1st Infantry Division badge. Now, he was a little bit of a black sheep of the family. And basically, he was desperately trying to prove himself to his parents because he dropped out of college. He, he, he wasn't settling in life. And he would break through the defences down at um, in between two exit points off the beach. He would then run under fire to get to a couple of tanks that had landed. He led them through the minefield and then directed their fire onto German bunkers, worked his way up with his uh, unit up on the bluff and went in to uh, advance further inland. German counterattack hits him. He holds the line for four and a half hours, ultimately, the, the eastern end of Omaha Beach, the flank for the Americans. Um, but after four and a half hours, he only has a handful of his men left. He decides to withdraw to the a German strong point that was in the hands of Americans. And unfortunately, he received a single bullet to, to his head uh, from a German rifleman and was killed instantly. He had, like many officers, and there is a higher ratio of officers to enlisted men in the cemetery to the reality of what was deployed, um, he'd written to his mother, should I fall, leave me with my men. And so he is a Medal of Honor recipient, and rightfully so for his incredible action, and he is still buried in the American cemetery. But All right, Jimmy speaking Mon of that, and Dale, we need to move this along. So I'm okay. going to scoot this along a little. Speaking of the American cemetery, here we are, just above the where the the offloading of the Higgin, Higgin boats we were just looking at. Yeah, right? where yeah. 9,300 American uh, crosses and stars of David lie. Right. Um, it's a it's yeah. a powerful site. It is the American cemetery at Saint Laurent, right above those beaches. Right, and it is. Um, there's not too much to say other than it's a powerful site to visit here with a with a terrific visitor center that's relatively new with a that really personalizes I think this visitor center it's really like a mini museum and tells stories of of the soldiers who who would lose their lives saving people they couldn't know right and as you said not a professional army that really comes through in this visitor center uh, and this quiet place to contemplate as you visit, uh, and it yeah, you write a, and it gives you a great perspective on the Omaha beaches. Dale, should yeah. we move along here? Quick stop. Yes. stop at Yep, so this is in the gold beach sector this year in the British sector at this point. Bayou is only positioned six miles behind this strong point, basically. And when you're there, you can see the three steeples of the cathedral. Um, now, Long Sierra Gun Battery, it, it basically is an artillery duel between a number of our ships and uh, this German gun position. It is the only six-inch guns that are still in position in their bunkers that remain along that two and a half thousand miles of an Atlantic wall, the coastal defensive zone. The reason I recommend that you try and get to this one, it's a visual. You know, you're seeing the Atlantic wall. You're seeing that the big ginormous gun casements. And also there is an incredible observation post that was used in the filming of The Longest Day that is down on the cliff edge that in theory should have been able to call fire down onto the German defences. Um, and this is one that... Um, is actually to the right of that observation post. It's several hundred yards to the left. But ultimately, you look at Normandy and you look at these places and the beauty of the countryside and the coastline uh, is incredible. And it's hard sometimes to imagine the violence that was going on there. Well said, really well said, yeah. And I thought maybe this image had that that uh, observation bunker, but it's just before this person. Yeah, anyway. so it's, uh, yeah. yeah. But it is it is a striking contrast with with what yeah. we visit otherwise, just the natural beauty of the area. Yeah. 
and here um, at Aromash uh, is wow. This the, our tourists, uh, our tour groups often stay at the hotel right there on that beach, the Hotel de La Marine. And Dale, why is this place famous? Why do we care about it? Okay, so I mentioned there are two artificial harbors, uh, one for the British, one for the Americans. Unfortunately, the, there are very little remains of the American one. There are elements, but uh, very little. And here, um, we still have a large amount of it. It's a little bit difficult for, for, for me to see how much you can see of it, but you can see large concrete cassons in the sea, and they yeah. made up an outer harbor wall. Um, we then had floating keys that we positioned that went up and down with the 28 foot average tidal drop a day, twice a day. And the ships would moor up alongside those. And then we constructed uh, eight and a half miles of floating road that would come from the floating keys to the beach. And by time that one artificial harbour is shut down, we have landed one and a half million soldiers there uh, and roughly 500,000 vehicles. But when you get there and you stand in the middle of that beach frontage and you look out and you see the remains of the harbour, um, the technology, the energy, the financial cost of, of building and designing them, it's, it blows you away. And I've visited it many times. And I have to say, even today, after hundreds of visits, I'm still blown away by the technology and the drive to, uh, to achieve. But of course, what you know, what's that famous saying? Um, you know, necessity is the mother of all invention, right, but right. primarily designed by the, the British. But as I say, there'll be one on, on either beach. Yeah, it is. It is powerful to walk on that beach. And there's one of the big caissons right there with my that these things were supposed to sink and go away years well, later. That, yeah, that that particular one that's on the beach, that's actually a section of the floating key that we is, is isn't it? That's right. Um, yeah. Cassons. I mean, to give you some idea, the bigger cassons out in the sea, each one weighs the same as the Eiffel Tower. You right. know, they are they're ginormous. Um, I want to see yeah, no still a big section, but it's uh, it's floating key. Yeah, I remember with when I was with uh, Rick and I were with you one time. I think there's still stuff is still washing up under the sand, right? They're still finding uh, elements of of the invasion from uh, all sorts of guns. I don't know helmets, etc. You name it. That just over time erodes or, or washes in. Is that right? That's yeah. still the case. Yeah, Utah Beach is probably the 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 best one for looking down and finding little yeah. bits of. Metal you know shrapnel or bits from the construction that was there and of course we we built we just just dug massive rubbish tips into the beaches and the problem is you know with millions of people going there that everyone's doing the same they're looking down trying to find stuff yeah. um yeah. if you really you know if if you're looking go inland um because this battle is four thousand two hundred right. square miles right. everybody right. focuses on d-day but the battle of normandy is 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 huge a brand new okay. museum just, just yeah. opened last year, dedicated in our marsh, right in the downtown, right in the center of what I just showed you. Um, here is the museum that that explains what Dale was just talking about. Just just opened last year. And there is an example of th this unbelievable accomplishment overnight. Almost this port, this artificial harbor that that the Germans didn't count on us providing to support the troops as they moved inland. Right. Wasn't that the yeah. whole point? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, basically, it, 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 it stops us objecting ourselves to landing in Normandy. It, it basically blocks the objection. So it allows us to land in Normandy as opposed to trying to do a full frontal assault in the Pas de Calais region. Um, but, you know, you look at it, it, it is just mind blowing. So they could generally offload 13 ships inside the, the harbour wall made up of the concrete cassons that you can see. Um, mm -hmm. They sunk obsolete ships around those because they only have a life expectancy of six months. So the fact that we still have quite a number of the cassons left is incredible. And then you can see the floating keys, uh, which are on there called uh, pier heads um, forming a wharf. And then you can see the long floating roads going uh, towards the, the beaches. But incredible structures. And as I say, you just stand in the middle there and you're, you're blown away. Now, this is Juno Beach. 
and I've mentioned the, the Canadians uh, pretty positively earlier on. This is actually the Juno Beach Centre, but more importantly, the it's surrounded by bunkers, and along the whole section of coast was one of the biggest German Widerstandness that was assaulted on D-Day. Um, unfortunately for the Winnipeg rifles that landed there, um, it was a bloodbath. Um, and the problem was, a bit like Omaha, on that little section of Juno, everything went wrong. And again... You know, I'll use the same statement. They still took it. Every, the bombardment missed. They were dragged uh, in the wrong direction. The two companies were split, split apart, um, but they still took it. But horrendous casualties for B Company of the Winnipegs. But just be aware that is only one section of Juno. The Canadians are landing on five or landing five different battalions um, in their first wave. So it's actually the second biggest first wave of any assault beach on, on D-Day. And I'm just going to reiterate, they get seven and a quarter miles inland from the beaches. It is further than anybody else. But I've already mentioned every single one of them is a volunteer. The level of motivation is, is incredible. Um, they all want to be in combat. So uh, Juno Beach is certainly worth a, a visit. And this is the Canadian Center, the Juno Beach Center, where it's really effectively done. And certainly for Canadians, it's essential, but for any traveler to see Juno Beach and to understand the Canadians' contribution. And this center does more than just talk about the history of the war and the disastrous and um, uh, event at Dieppe. It talks about can Canada's relationship to France today and yesterday and the importance of it. It is a it is a, a, a a very helpful and informative site beyond in in addition to learning about the landings and the Canadians important role in that and by the way just inland maybe by five miles or so from here is the very uh, I, I'd like to say a, a, a class appropriately um uh, low profile Canadian cemetery when you compare it to the grand brilliant white crosses of of the Amer American cemetery it's very humble much much like a lot of my Canadian friends I think it it speaks to their um to their character and um and it's a it's a powerful sight to see and Dale yeah. and here we go to wrap things up right um oof. I love this quote, just just to and thank our viewers for hanging in there with us. It's a lot of information um, that you need. You could I, I'll bet you get the idea now. You need a day. You need a day to, to take in some of these just a few museums and a local guide like Dale. And I list several good ones. Thanks to Dale. Believe me, he's not the only good one who can take you around the D-Day beaches. But he is certainly one of my favorite examples of what competence is in guiding us around. The fight, the, uh, oh, you know, I can't read the whole quote. Can you read that for me, Dale? Yeah, they, they fight not for the lust of conquest. They fight to end, end conquest. They fight to liberate Franklin D. Roosevelt. And thank you, Dale. But thank I, you. I will see you in September, I hope. Um, even if it's not as my guide, I will be there and I'll see you then. I'll be staying in our own mosh then, but I, I look forward to seeing you. And, yeah, no. um, Likewise. All right. And uh, Ben, I'll hand it right back to you. I think that's good. Um, and again, thank the listeners. I know we went a little bit long, but uh, um, hope it was worthwhile. All right. Thank you so much. Wow. Truly a fantastic presentation. I learned a lot and you've inspired me to visit the, the D-Day beaches. Um, I have some excellent questions for you both. I section on travel skills I'd like to get to in a history section. But first, I would like to mention a brief word from our sponsor. And actually, I would like it to focus on the two of you. So Dale, as we've heard from you and from Steve, you offer tours. And I just want to point out that we've linked to your website with information about your tours in the links uh, in the chat section of the webinar. And also, these will be included in our follow-up email. Uh, tomorrow evening. And Dale, you offer a few different tours, is that right, of different lengths, from one day, yeah. even like a, a two-day tour, is that correct? Yeah, I do. I do um, 11, I, I market 11 different tours, um, mm -hmm. obviously American, British, Canadian, then multiple day tours, and then uh, any specialist tours. So if people have a relative that, that fought in the Normandy battle, um, it doesn't have to be D-Day, you know, they can have landed a month later, then you can follow their, their their route. But that's very kind of you to to do that and put the link there, Ben. Thank you. Oh, it's the least we could do, Dale. Absolutely. By the way, Ben, 
I want to advise our listeners to book him or the top guys I list early, right, Dale? I mean, really early, six months, yeah. a year ahead. Yeah. Yeah. People are getting, um, how can I word it? Pe- people are getting more organized. You know, they 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 want to tie in uh, all the elements way in advance so that they're getting what they want, you know, whether it be the hotel or it, it be a guide or restaurants. Um, and um, of course, for those people coming late or last minute, it is making it more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. Very good advice. And Steve, you mentioned your listings. Well, that's the other piece of the word from our sponsor is the book you co-authored. That should be promotion enough, I think. But beyond even that point, it's currently on sale for $10 at ricksteves.com. Or you can wait for the next edition, which will be out at the end of the month, which will have some updated information, which, Steve, you so carefully researched and updated. But um, there's a a beefy section on Normandy and the D-Day beaches with a lot of recommendations, suggestions on local guides, as you mentioned, and, and much more. So I would definitely recommend the France book, which, Steve, you have so lovingly worked on for so many years at a boy Ben and you know one thing that reminds me of looking at that book Normandy is much more than the D-Day beaches they are hugely important but I tried to give an overview of how much there is in this region and and to slow down uh, your your travels and there's a lot of information in that chapter it's a huge chapter is Normandy and it merits it yeah very good point okay diving into some questions thank you Emily for sending these along We'll start with travel skills. Can you have a worthwhile visit to D-Day as a day trip from Paris? It's funny. People do it a lot. And you know, with bullet train technology, et cetera, you, you can. Um, I, uh, you can. Uh, it's it's a, a full day. It is a full day. And the guides can meet you at the train stations. It depends on whether you're in Comp or in Bayeux. I would, I would like to start in Bayeux. But boy, if you can spend a night, what a difference that makes. Um, um, and and it, you're just not, I mean, you're spending as much time traveling to and from as a day trip. Yes, you can do it. But boy, if you can get a night out, at least I would love to see that. And that leads us to the next question then. If you were planning a trip to Normandy and D-Day, roughly what would be your general ideal itinerary? Well, just what we, we you can do in a day. Mm-hmm. on your own or with a guide what dale just went through it is a long day and you need to be pretty organized and and yeah um but you can do it in a day it's starting you know i usually it's easier to start in aero Manche, where the landings where the artificial harbor was um placed and move yourself the opposite direction we went but either way works really does um, and that's 54 miles you're covering remember once you're there but boy, those sites, each one of them is a good hour of your time, good hour and a half. So you can add those up uh, and it's it's a full day. <clears throat> I, I ought to just point something yeah. out there. So just in relation to any one day tour, you would have to really try and stay in one area. Um, and what I mean by that is Utah or Omaha as a, as a day, um, because even that from Bayou, you'll be doing 105 miles throughout the day. Now, it won't feel like it because you're breaking it up, you're conversing, you're pointing things out, and it flies by. Um, But, yeah, Omaha, Utah one day, and then British sector another. There are companies that might drive you to uh, Long Sumer as a first stop and head, but it's sacrificing something on the other. So a day will get you either British Canadian beaches and airborne or American airborne and the two American beaches, yeah. The top... Just simply put, um, Arabash, um, the American Cemetery, Omaha Beach, Point du Hook, and Utah Beach. Yeah, and yeah, you're looking at a day and a half probably, aren't you really, Dale? Realistic. Yeah. yeah. Is renting a car beneficial, or should you forget the car, just arrive on the train or use oh, public it's... transit, and then get a get a guide? Or oh, it's 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 very beneficial, mm-hmm. right? And absolutely, but you're spending a lot of your time navigating, trying to find parking. Where do I go? Um, and this is that one place in France where the Americans and Canadians, in particular, really want to get the most out of their time. So, and there are a variety of guide services. There, there are guide services where you can join as an independent traveler, just two people, a, a minibus. And it's less expensive and you're with a group of people, uh, but they'll use your time well. And they're listed in the book as well. 
and if you have more time, the, the latest, Dale, you'll appreciate this. I've been impressed with the uh, the now with electronic bikes that so many, it's it's six miles from Bayou is the good base to, to base yourself at, to ride to the beaches. And there are bike trails and, um, and, and um, good structure now that's set up, particularly with electric bikes, that allow people to, to tour the Diddy beaches by bike, which used to be a crazy idea, in my opinion, and still is in a sense. I, I want to get around to get places. <laughs> But no, um, I won't be doing any of those. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're not going to be doing that. But some people are committed to bicycles and it does work now. It really yeah. does. Good. What I would say in relation to turning up at the train station is if you're turning up, don't turn up and expect there to be three minibuses waiting um, unless you've pre-booked. So right. there'll be local companies that will come and collect you. Yeah. But I've been there a couple of times recently and, um, you know, a couple will come walking towards you. I want a D-Day tour. And you're like, well, <laughs> I'm waiting for a private tour. There's no other guides here. You won't get one. And they've just come out from Paris getting up at 4.30 in the morning, you know, mm -hmm. so and catching the train at seven minutes past six. So my advice is you, if you want a guide, you must book it now before you, you set off. And, you know, there's a lot of big companies with a lot of volume and a lot of guides, minibuses. So the reality is, unless you're you're um, booking in the really busy months, May, June, September, um, you should be able to get on a on a tour, even if you're trying to book, a, you know, a week early or a few days before. You will probably find somebody that's available for a, for a mixed group tour. I'm, I'm talking there. Private tour, of course, you've, you've got a pre-book uh, way in advance. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Dale. And um, by the way, if you're renting a car when you get there, uh, you have to really rent in Caen, C-A-E-N, the bigger city, mm -hmm. right at the train station. It's really too, too it doesn't work in Bayeux, but it does work very well in Caen. The train stops in Caen before Bayeux. It's 20 minutes away by train. Um, yeah. Yeah. Very important point. Thank you both. Yeah. Dale, switching to a few history questions before we wrap things up this evening or this morning for the two of you. Uh, yeah. can you can you discuss the Slapton Sands disaster just briefly? We have a few people who asked about that. Yeah, so um, unfortunately, uh, the 4th Infantry Division and its attached units were doing an exercise off Slapton Sands, south coast of England, where we had basically built Widerstand um, the, the Everybody would load up. They would go out in their LSTs, landing ship tanks and other craft, and then they would um, do uh, live firing rehearsals. And unfortunately, quite a few uh, lights had been left on on the ships um, of the American force that was going to do the practice run. Um, it was called Exercise Tiger. And unfortunately, a German motor torpedo boat squadron was in the area and they went into the attack. So a couple of uh, the landing ship tanks were sunk. A couple were badly damaged. Um, we now believe that the figure of dead is closing in on a, on a thousand. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of figures give it as 960, 980, but it, it's close to a thousand men died. So when you actually look at the Utah Beach assault, my gut feeling is that actually crossing the beach in the first wave, you're probably looking at 15 to 20 men who don't get across the beach. And that's killed, wounded and missing. <laughs> so to lose nearly a thousand in the rehearsal before you know, was an incredible loss. And because of the, the loss um, and the fact we didn't want the Germans knowing, um, it was all covered up and only released about 50 years later. Um, I actually was lucky enough to meet a veteran um, who I met at uh, Utah Beach about seven, eight years ago. And he was there to re in, back in Europe to receive his silver star that had been stripped from him. So he was awarded the award for bravery during that exercise and rescuing men. But then he was told to hand it back in because the incident hadn't occurred. So he was finally getting the, the recognition that he, he deserved. Uh, was, you know, 70 plus years later. But um, very sad, um, particularly as the beach was such a success. You know, you, you measure the exercise in relation to um, the loss of life on D-Day for Utah. And it's it's five times, six times, seven times higher. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Wow. Wow. Unbelievable. Well, 
as several of our viewers said, I think we could actually have an encore presentation, a, a part two to this. Um, but oh. uh, we'll we'll see about that in the future. So for now, yeah. I'll just ask one more question, Dale. George asked, and this is this is fairly fairly broad. Um, should or how should the memory and story of D-Day influence current and future military operations? Wow. <laughs> and that's kind of a tough one. No, it's, 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 a, it's a great question. Um, I think ultimately war has completely changed. Uh, you know, I see in 20 years time where very few human beings will be deployed. You know, we're already dealing with aircraft that are, are drones uh, and that are carrying out m most uh, aerial attacks nowadays. So I, I think warfare is completely changing. What is What lessons should be learned from it? that if there is an evil in the world, that it needs to be crushed. And for me, the negative of World War II is that we, we were on this massive moral high ground. We had stopped the Holocaust or you know, done, done what we could to stop it. We had um, freed all of the democracies of, of Europe and so on. And then we picked which conflicts we wanted to be involved in based on what they offered us, um, rather than picking it on, on what World War II was for the Americans. And that is, you know, defeating an absolute evil um, and, and, re and holding that moral high ground. Um, and I think for me, that's the lesson we should have learned that we didn't. We just picked the one that suited us at the time in relation to whatever problems we thought were going on at the time. Um, but in terms of strategy and tactics and so on, of course, leadership is always going to be incredibly important. But I, I, I think ultimately that, that warfare has changed so much that a lot of the things that were relevant on D-Day are not relevant today. Of course, there are many things that are relevant, but yeah, it's a, it's a different time in the world. And I, I see that, as I say, the next 20 years where there will not be that many human beings that will be deployed into combat zones. That, that's my own personal view. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, it's so important that people remember D-Day and your work is so valuable. And I, I think what we've learned tonight in this presentation is really something special. I thank you both so much. This was fantastic. Um, and many of our travelers, I know, have written many great comments about, about what you've discussed here as well. And, and um, I thank you both for getting up in the middle of the night to discuss <laughs> this important history with us on such an important time, the 80th anniversary. No, no thank you very much. It's, it's been a pleasure. And, and Dale, what will what will you do on the 80th day on June sixth? Will you be involved in the celebrations at all? Or are you going to stay home and lock yourself in? Yeah, you you can't get to the to the the major sites. The even the main route, National Thirteen, around the Omaha uh, Gold Beach sector is all closed up with world like, so many world leaders going. Uh, I'll tell you what I do. I go and sit in a field, or I go and look at a field, and I think because I live in the American sector, I just try and imagine a 19 year old kid with his buddy walking across the field, expecting the crack of a bullet at any point. And even if, even if there wasn't a crack of a bullet, you know, what emotions are going through those kids' minds as they're advancing towards the next hedgerow. So I, I tend to just make it very personal. And, and, and let's not forget as D-Day guides, depending on how many days you work, every day we're remembering them, every day we're sharing their stories. So I don't, I don't feel that, you know, it's necessary for me to be involved in all the massive celebrations anymore. They're great. You know, if you come and do it, you know, it'll blow you away, the, the, the enormity of it all um, and how much you can do, how much you can see, how many military vehicles are here. But for me, I, I just keep it very personal. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, with that, I... We'll say good night to both of you and to all of our fellow travelers this evening. Thank you so much for joining us for this look at D-Day in Normandy. And next week, we will be off to a truly underrated city, Budapest, one of my personal favorites. Good night, Dale. Good night, Steve. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night.